So we're going to try to finish on time in 10 minutes. This would be a good time to fill out the green forms, evaluation-wise. Oh, yes. So I'm Irina Tsui, one of the pediatric retina and adult retina specialists at UCLA in Doheny. I've had the opportunity to travel down to Rio quite a few times in the past few years, and I just wanted to share my experience there and give an overview about the story of Zika in general, which has been captivating the world. So um, just a brief history about Zika as an, intro as an introduction. It was first found in the Zika forest in 1950 in a um, science la laboratory there. It was studied and went relatively unnoticed for decades, but it has been circulating and kind of spread through Africa and Asia. At some point, there were two different strains, so now they are quite different. There's an African lineage and an Asian li li lineage. A few outbreaks occurred, um, 2007, 2013. The 2013 one in French Polynesia was notable because it was associated with Guillain-Barre. Um, and then the big one, of course, hit in May in 2015. Um, it coincided uh, with the Olympics as well, which caused a lot of media attention about whether to cancel and whether athletes would travel there, et cetera. And so in looking back, after we knew about the epidemic in Brazil, it turns out there were higher cases of microcephaly in the prior epidemics as well. It just wasn't known at the time that those epidemics had happened. And um, the association of microcephaly and Zika virus came about in October of 2015. At first, it wasn't believed or known that it was caused by Zika, and they thought it was the pesticides used to kill the mosquitoes in the area. It wasn't until um, two case reports came out of the OB literature where amnio was done on two pregnant women with microcephaly, and Zika virus PCR was found in the amniotic fluid. Um, and then shortly after that, the eye manifestations were reported associated with infants born with microcephaly that came out in January of 2016. Um, Brazil did dis, uh, declare a state of emergency for a few years. Over 5,000 babies were born at that time um, with microcephaly. They're about two to three years old now, and we're still following them as part of our research study. One of the reasons why it was so much of a problem is because um, ab abortions are not legal there. So even if there was profound microcephaly or birth defects um, found in the prenatal screening period, all the infants were born, almost all the infants were born unless they died pre prematurely. Um, and just of note, the first US case was reported out of Baskin Palmer in July of 2016. So here we are now in 2018. One of the most frequent questions that gets asked is, is there still Zika? Is it still an issue? Is it going to come here? The epidemic is over. It is still circulating in low levels. So you can go on the CDC web website where all the cases are um, logged there. And it has dropped very much. But there are still a few handful of cases occurring in the US and in um, Rio as well. Okay, so a little bit more as by way of introduction. The symptoms of Zika virus in an adult are pretty mild and relatively non-specific. It's fever, low-grade fever, rash, fatigue, things of that nature. So pretty harmless. Most adults will get over it, and most adults actually don't even know that they have it. It is asymptomatic in 80%. The problem, really the only problem with it, is if a pregnant woman gets Zika for the first time while she's pregnant, she doesn't have antibodies to it, and it causes very bad birth defects, namely microcephaly and some other ones that I'll go into in a bit. Another unique thing about Zika is that not only is it, is it a new torch infection, it's also known to be an STD, and it's also transmitted by m mosquitoes. So it is unique in that way. We know of um, nothing other that is all three transmittable by all three mechanisms. So the full spectrum of uh, Zika syndrome encompasses these five things. Besides the microcephaly, there are um, intracranial calcifications, retinal scarring is part of the definition. There's also congenital contractions, contractors, and marked early hypertonia. Um, that being said, not all infants present with all five of these findings, and that's one of the unique things about our study is that we were able to um, examine and follow babies that did not have the full spectrum of disease 
and it's because we have PCR testing, basically. So laboratory confirmation is very difficult because the antibody test cross-reacts with dengue, which is also circulates in the same areas where there are mosquitoes and where Zika is. So the only, and so most of the reports in the studies could only report on babies with microcephaly, where they ruled out other causes of microcephaly, congenital, um, like genetic sy syndromes, family history of microcephaly. They did a torch panel to rule out all the other in infections. And then they would say, okay, an infant born with microcephaly in an endemic area is presumed to have Zika. The real way to prove it is to do PCR testing, since antibody testing doesn't work. And that is expensive and not readily available in Rio and Brazil and Puerto Rico, Venezuela, all the other countries which um, has Zika. Um, I already told you that most people are asymptomatic and the incubation period um, is about three to 16 days. So even with PCR testing, the window of positivity is only about two weeks. Um, so uh, PCR testing um, is helpful, but also does not capture all cases of Zika-related. Um, infection. So how did the collaboration between UCLA and Institute Ferdinand Figueroa in Rio start? Um, it started because of Brazilian contacts. One of the infectious disease doctors at UCLA, she went to, she was born and raised and went to medical school in Rio, and so she still had a lot of medical school friends there. And at one of the infectious d disease meetings, um, during the time that Zika was uh, occurring. You know, I feel like interest of time, it's not that interesting. Basically, there were two doctors from Rio that, that, they, that they knew each other. <laughs> and, so, and so, but one uh, interesting thing is that the doctor that she met there, she had an IRB studying dengue and pregnant women for over a 10 year period. So it was very easy and fast to modify the IRB and start to collect prospective specimens on women who were pregnant with symptoms of Zika. And so that is how we were able to get a PCR positive group of pregnant women in, in Rio, which is just kind of a lucky thing. The other thing is we have established a multi-specialty group. So our, um, we have a team at UCLA consisting of ophthalmology, OB, um, infectious disease, radiology as well, which I didn't list there, and laboratory scientists, and we have a counterpart there in Rio. So in that way, we're really able to leverage both of our strengths, and they're able to collect data there um, with us. So there are just three studies that I want to talk about. The first one, we looked at all of our PCR positive um, children, which again, we were the only one to have it because of the circumstances. We had the in-house test where we could do PCR very cheaply. They had a person that made the test in the hospital. And also we had the cohort of pregnant women who were being studied for dengue. So from that, um, there were 112 pregnant women with PCR positive Zika virus and all other things were ruled out and um, also had an eye exam. 24 infants had eye abnormalities. Those had been described before by other groups. So it's optic nerve atrophy, hypoplasia, cordial retinal scarring, RP modeling. So it wasn't the novelty of the findings in our study. It was that infants without microcephaly also had these findings. So that had never been for, before been able to be studied because everybody could only study the microcephaly group for reasons I explained. So that changed the CDC screening criteria where they did not, where previously they only recommended eye exams for children born with microcephaly. And since our paper was published, they expanded it to any type of laboratory con confirmation. That being said, like I said, no one gets laboratory con confirmation. So it was a win, but it practically didn't change that, you know, all. It didn't actually change all that much. So then our next paper was recently um, accepted in pediatrics. And this one, we expanded it not only to our PZR positive children, but also the ones that either tested negative or they weren't tested. So that expanded our cohort to more um, babies. And the idea of this study was just to show that the eye findings were the same, that in our co cohort, whether there was PCR positivity or not, the eye findings were similar, just to kind of confirm the other studies. And um, if didn't have PCR positive, we define presumed Zika by the mother had symptoms of Zika during pregnancy, or there were prenatal ultrasound abnormalities, 
um, or the infant was born with other issues like microcephaly um, that gave them the stigma of Zika. Um, so those were our PCR unconfirmed groups. And also they had all the other infections ruled out. Uh, so this is the third paper, which I think is probably the more interesting one. And in this, we looked at visual function of these children at three to six months to see if um, assessing visual function, meaning fix and follow vision at three to six months, or the presence of nystagmus was helpful as another screening measure. The idea here is in resource poor settings where perhaps not every baby can go see an eye doctor, could a general pediatrician pick up Zika virus related eye issues? And the answer is yes. So this is important because those two things are part of the American Academy of um, Ophthalmology and American Academy of Pediatric and APOST gui guidelines that a general pediatrician should be screening for visual function at three to six months. And if that's not happening, then they should be sent to an ophthalmologist for a full eye ex exam. So if that were to occur in our cohort, all structural eye abnormalities would have been found. Um, so that is the significance of the third paper. So in summary, our PCR positive cohort is special as laboratory testing is problematic and expensive. And so our cohort actually continues to grow. We thought the incident, our cohort, there's about 300 kids. We thought it would get smaller as babies either passed away or moved or lost a follow up. But actually, because of our study, they're coming from other places. So at two to three year, years old, we are having new babies with microcephaly or other stigma of Zika enter into our um, study, and we continue to follow them. They're now two to three years old. We're collecting the Bailey data and looking at that now. We're looking at their visual function, and also um, on Andrea Zinn, the pediatric ophthalmologist there, they have to give a lot of credit to for her weekly, daily work on this. She also gave overplus glasses for infants with really poor vision where they couldn't fix and follow. And it looks like the overplus glasses seem to help. We don't know if with time it would have gotten better, but it's kind of a novel treatment that could be applied not only to Zika babies, but other cer cerebral palsy kids, which essentially is what the Zika ba babies have. They have like a form of cer cerebral palsy. Um, and these are some more pictures, and that's it, and we're almost on time. So again, thank you so much. There's no need to clap for me. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone, for coming to our first pediatric ophthalmology um, course. Yes? In yeah, it's pregnancies. a good question. It's a really good question. We don't know the answers to that. It's presumed that it is primary in infection, that it has to be that. But we actually don't know that if subsequent kids, whether the mother gets a reactivation or such, we don't know. It's one of the questions that the OBs are looking at. Um, there haven't been a lot of pregnancies since, and also, you know, it devastates the fam families. To have a baby with Zika, it's a resource thing, both fi financially, socially. Um, so I don't know that a lot of them are actively trying to have more kids. Uh, so I don't know the answer. It's a very good question. Okay. Not to talk to you, Rick. Um, the, you're following these children longitudinally, but that looks like a stable, quiet scar in the retina. Do you expect any ongoing changes from the virus? Don't know. Like for toxo example, which is not a virus, but toxo it can, and it looks like a toxo scar in some ways. But so far, no. They've been following them every three months, and there has been no reactivation. But I think our interest is also in correlating the neurological outcomes with visual function. Um, and also, I think giving attention to what they call invisibles, and that people don't really care about children born with severe birth defects or disabilities. And the belief is that with ther ther therapy and early in intervention, it could really make a difference. And they have tried to institute those things early on to show that these babies can grow up to have some quality of life and be of use to their families, if not society as a whole. Okay, thank you again, everyone, for coming. <laughs>